everyone. Welcome to the Learning to Birth webinar series where we interview some of the world's most interesting, inspiring thought leaders about birth and pregnancy. We have with us today, Corey Gentry. Welcome, Corey. Hi, thanks for having me. Yay. Uh, I've got such hair. I've got such hair envy here. Like, oh my God, it's, it's beautiful. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Um, everyone, Corey Gentry is the creator of Birth Chemistry, Birth Education Classes, uh, a Taleba trained birth doula and birth activist, and as an evidence-based birth instructor. So um, Corey offers trainings to obstetricians, midwives, nurses, and other doulas in her community, in addition to working with expectant families. That's incredible. What was it like? You've created your own kind of system and model for birth education. Like what? What took you down that journey? Yeah, absolutely. So I grew up on a farm. I've seen all of the things be born. And I always saw birth as just a normal life process, right? And then I actually went into childcare and all of the parents that I spoke with had really traumatic birth stories. I just became really drawn to birth stories. Um, so what, and then what I was hearing was a really similar stories over and over again, like all, everyone almost always dies, but it was like a similar pattern. So that's how I kind of got down the road of birth work, was yeah, listening yeah. to people's birth stories. Um, and then moving towards, I taught other curriculums and there was always something missing from every curriculum that I was teaching. Either there wasn't enough evidence backing up what was being recommended or um, there wasn't inclusion of all kinds of families. I do use gender inclusive terminology in my curriculum. Um, you know, not everybody is a, uh, is, is a, has a husband or a boyfriend or um, you know, is married. So I wanted to make sure everyone was included. So yeah, so that just little by little over the last eight years, I have, come to where I've arrived now, which is teaching families, obstetricians, midwives, nurses, kind of across the board. Incredible. Do you want to tell us about some of your births? Would you like to share your experiences with us? Yeah, my own birth stories? Yeah. Sure, yeah. So I've given birth five times. Um, we got pregnant with our first in 2009, and we had expected to have an unmedicated birth. Um, we had prepared with the Bradley method. Um, I'm not sure how's that is that well known over there. Oh, we actually had one of the Bradley method teachers, Leah Burquist. Um, oh, amazing! Yeah, give it all. We have you. so much to owe, Dr. Bradley. Um, but at the same time, I kind of felt like I had failed because all I learned from Bradley, from the instructor I had, was don't get an induction, and it turns out I needed an induction for medical reasons. And so I felt like I was out of control in the process. So I left that birth having had the cascade of interventions just short of a cesarean. And I felt like parents needed to know all of their options just in case we, we need to move from a home birth to a hospital birth or we need to have a cesarean birth. We need to have a really positive experience no matter what the outcome, not outcome focused, but journey focused. So my next baby, we switched care providers. We went with a midwife in a hospital. I had the unmedicated birth that I had hoped for, but at the same time, my waters were broken when I didn't want them to be. I was put on my back and it was, I realized that all that mattered was not just a natural birth, but that I was a decision maker throughout the entire process. So for our third birth, we had planned a home birth. And I'm so grateful for this experience because it made me such a better educator because I went over 42 weeks and here in California, you cannot have a home birth after 42 weeks with the attendance of a midwife. So I ended up having a hospital transfer, uh, hospital transfer, but, and I needed some interventions. I needed another induction. It was so different because I was a decision maker every single moment. I decided how we induced. I decided what position I would be in. When anyone would touch me, I was the deciding factor in what was going to happen. And so I learned that, again, it's not outcome focused, that whether or not you have a home birth or a hospital birth or a birth center birth or a natural birth or a medicated birth or a cesarean birth, 
does not matter as much as who is the decision maker, right? And how are you made to feel during your birth? So I was holding my third baby, who was a big baby, 11 pounds, five ounces. Um, and I was holding my giant baby and uh, I was holding a giant burrito in the other arm. Um, so that's what I've been craving. And I looked at my husband three hours after I said, the next one at home. And that's what we did. So uh, this was all about 18 months apart, each baby. Next baby was born just behind me on that couch that you can see right behind me. We had hoped to have a water birth, but didn't quite make it into the water. So um, I had my home birth, I had my medicated birth, another big baby, 10 pound baby. Um, and then just uh, 11 months ago, we welcomed our fifth baby. I have four little boys that just had a little girl in October. Oh my God. And we were, regar regardless boy or girl, we were gonna be thrilled either way. And this time, so I gave birth at three different local hospitals at home. And then we went to a freestanding birth center that um, I am lucky enough to be a part of the team um, there. And I had my water birth I had desired. Um, I had three doulas, a little bit extra, um, and my amazing midwife. So that's a little bit, I've learned something from every single one of my births. That's a little bit about my journey, my personal journey um, in birth work. That's an incredible <laughs> story. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> so empowering though. It's, you know, it's your story, your journey. You did it. You made it. And not only did you do that, you're a teacher, you know, out of it. Tell us like, what is the birth chemistry model? Like what, what is different about it? How did you create it? What do people get out of it? Yeah. So like I said, I, I've taught some different curriculums. Um, and I have also myself as a pregnant person taken different kinds of birth classes. Mm -hmm. And something I noticed was that many birth classes seem to advocate for one route towards comfort, right? Um, I love hypnosis and birth, but it's not going to be the best option for everybody. I love sleep simulation, which is the primary um, method in Bradley, for example, but it's not going to work for everybody. And I wanted for there to be a curriculum where I didn't just give you a tool, but the entire tool shed. Wow. I, I wanted to use movement. Yeah. I wanted to use visualization, acupressure, massage, so that you don't know how you're, what's going to really resonate with you when you're in labor. Also, I wanted something that wasn't outcome focused. I didn't want there to be a goal of you have to have a vaginal birth or a home birth or a natural birth for you to have a positive birth experience. So I, and the next thing that was very important was that evidence-based. I wanted to have studies to back things up. So there were times in the past of the curriculums where we were advocating for various methods um, in labor to, to create comfort. And there really wasn't evidence to back that up. And so I just wanted to be able to be really transparent with my students. Um, so I went ahead and created birth chemistry. I was not begging to write a curriculum. I would have been very happy. I actually, um, I took a really phenomenal training on supporting LGBTQ families, 2015, I think. Um, and I asked the people that were doing the training, do you know of any childbirth ed curriculums out there right now that are completely gender inclusive, no matter whether you're partnered or not partnered. And um, they said no. So I was kind of put in the position that if I want to teach a, a completely inclusive curriculum that is evidence-based, I'm gonna have to write it. So that's what I did from 2000, about 2015, I launched it in uh, 2000. 16, I was kind of trying it out 2017 um, and then uh, I've been started just training people in 2019 yeah so yeah. just earlier this year that's amazing yeah. you know it's just I'm just so happy that you had that vision of I want I want a course you know that's inclusive and visionary and oh my god you created it like to have that kind of to be able to draw on that inner well of I'm going to, I see something and I'm going to do it like that. That's some strong, like mother power there. Like, you know, that's often like birth can really open up that power inside of us to go. Yeah. I want that for myself. I want that for people, for the world. I'm going to go, 
create it, go do it. Just, you know, how, do you want to like, what are the, some of the stories from the, the families you've worked with? Are there any like stories that you've just gone, wow, that was amazing. I'm so happy to have been part of that journey with them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we do a class reunion after we actually just, I just had one today. So what? after the babies arrive, we do a reunion. So all the parents can share their birth stories and support one another. And I actually had one client that I had, a, it was a class of seven. Yeah. And I already knew from all the clients that six of them had had unmedicated births and all seven couples had the goal of an unmedicated birth. And so I knew that six of them had unmedicated births and I knew one of them had had a cesarean birth. And I was getting a little, I was a little worried. This is a few years ago, maybe three um, or so years ago. I was starting to get a little worried that they might feel like the odd person out. And so everyone goes around and shares their stories and the last person to share their story is the person with the cesarean and so she shared her story of laboring for four days and she labored on the beach and in a hotel and close to the hospital in their home and then going to the hospital and laboring and getting to 10 centimeters and then pushing and deciding that this was no that she felt like her intuition was saying the baby was not going to come this way and mm -hmm. that she made the decision. This is my goal is not to have a vaginal birth at all costs because it was a VBAC, a vaginal birth after cesarean. My goal is a positive birth. And so she decided I want a cesarean and her doctor was like, we don't have to do that. Like that it, it's up to you. And she said, no, this is going to be a cesarean. She got off of the bed, walked into the OR, which is not typical for people who um, have attended the cesarean birth. Um, she asked that they put Christmas music on because it was Christmas Eve. And her doula was present and her baby was born out of her tummy, went straight to her arms, um, just like, you know, in a vaginal birth. And everything was her decision. It turns out that this was a true instance of cephalopelvic disproportion. We could see from the baby's molding that the baby's head was not going to come through her pelvis. So it was not an unnecessary cesarean. And everyone in the room during this, the Territorian's birth story, you know, it's not a competition, of course. We are honoring and excited for every single birth. But everyone was like, whoa, that was like, the most badass story we just heard tonight and everyone was just surrounded her with support she was very proud of herself and so it was one of those moments where i had this vision for parents feeling really proud and positively about their birth whether it's a vaginal or cesarean birth and it was really amazing to see that actually happening to see that she was still really happy and fulfilled um and i have other stories that are similar and it was just very validating that's really speaking to that power of um you know that inner sense of knowing the authority of the intuition because mm -hmm. that was similar in my second birth i'd planned it all at home i had the birth pool blown <laughs> up hoses ready and um yeah. i just knew i knew i had to go into that hospital and i knew baby wasn't going to come at home and be able to do it and i so i was brave and I walked into that hospital and um you know all was well and um it, it's just amazing you just you just when you tap into that inner power you know you have so much intuition about yourself and that, that's that's a real credit to the course that you taught that it wasn't just about this external model of this is right this is wrong you actually connected that mama to her inner power and her inner knowing and she was yeah. able to have a positive birth because of that you know, you don't talk about outcomes, you talk about the journey. What is What are the ingredients to a positive journey through birth? Absolutely. So there's a few things. It depends, of course, what is your, what is your, uh, you know, it's okay to have goals, right? So it's not about an outcome as in vaginal or um, cesarean or anything like that. But there's some elements that might be really important to you. So for example, um, many people want to be the decision maker. Many people want to be holding their baby immediately after the birth, things like that. So one thing is 
get educated, of course. A childbirth educator is going to be like, take a birth class, very important. Um, something you can access anywhere. Um, you know, we do have birth chemistry instructors across the nation right now, but I also, I'm also an evidence-based birth instructor, and we have evidence-based birth instructors across the country. We teach a six-week hybrid series where you do um, two in person and then four like Zoom meetings like this. So perfect for super busy millennials. Um, so education is key. Next is gonna be support. So to have the right team to support you and to make sure that they're gonna give you space to make the decisions. So when you go to talk to your midwife or your obstetrician, use open-ended questions, ask them what do you think about and then fill in what maybe one of your goals is. So maybe you know you're going to need a cesarean birth, but you want to have your baby not go straight to the warmer, but come straight to your skin. So instead of saying, I want this thing, saying, what do you think about people doing this, right? Or if you want to, you're, you're hoping to give birth on a birth stool in a hospital setting, or you want to have your doula present, just ask, what do you think about that? And to, to hear them. Having the support of a doula is incredible, so important. I've had doulas at my last four births, so good. Um, did you have a, a, a doula at your birth? Uh, I had the first time a doula, and then I had her back for the second birth, but like something in me was just like, I just couldn't have her there. I think- Go you know, with I your intuition. With the father who'd been at the first birth, so I think the second birth, I just wanted it completely different. So I, I, had, I had a friend basically who came in and stepped in as my daughter. She had four babies naturally at home herself in a birth pool. So she was everything I ever wanted, you know, and more. So, yeah. Perfect. It's so good and important to have someone there in your corner, right? Supporting if you are coupled with someone, the entire couple, right? Um, so when mama's having a hard time or the birthing person is having a hard time and is like, where are we at? Is everything okay? That, you know, the partner, if there's a partner, might be like, I don't know, right? This might be their first birth they've ever attended. So to be able to look at somebody to say, that says, yeah, you're doing great. You look amazing right now, right? To have someone with some credibility, right? Yes, yeah, um, credibility. Yeah. Support. yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the other thing that I always recommend to people so um, is to process any fears that you might have ahead of time because they're going to bubble up in birth. Right. So if you've had a really difficult um, relationship with your with your own parents or if you have a lot of fear about becoming a parent yourself or if you've had a past trauma, um, traumatic birth to get support and therapy for that, to process that ahead of time. So these are just a few of the ingredients to a positive birth experience um, and then know, oh, knowing ahead of time what support is available to you afterwards. So find out about the support groups in your area. Find out about breastfeeding, if you're going to be breastfeeding or chest feeding. Um, find about, about what, what free groups are in the area. There's oftentimes one or two. Um, and, uh, you know, parenting groups, things like that. Because so often we end up just getting stuck in our little bubble, maybe just on social media and staying at home with our little one, but not actually getting that face-to-face important time in your community yeah all of that is great information that we all need um definitely definitely think about doulas look them up there's it's amazing now actually just this huge blooming of doulas that's happening i mean back when i had my doula 12 years ago it was really rare. I think maybe in the city I was in, maybe there was like two or three and she'd already yeah. like done 500 birds. But now you just hop on Facebook and there's, you know, a hundred dollars everywhere. So it's wonderful. It's amazing. You know, you're, you're, you're going to be educating people about, you know, pain relief and medications and everything. What do people know, need to know about, you know, pain medications and other medications going into their births? Totally. So pharmaceutical pain relief options are a great tool. But they, as we like to say with epidurals, epidurals come with friends, right? So it's really important that people know what all goes into some of these interventions. So for example, with an epidural, you're going to have your blood pressure cuff attached to you the whole time, and you're going to have your IV in your hand, 
You're gonna have the pulse oximeter on your finger. You're gonna have the monitors on your belly. You're gonna have the epidural going into your back. And then you're going to have a bladder catheter as well. And then depending on where you're giving birth, you might also have an internal fetal monitor. And in order to do that, we have to break your water. And then this little coil goes screws into the baby's scalp. And so what some parents don't know is that there's, there's potential risks with this choice. Is an epidural the best thing for some parents? Absolutely. However, here where I live, about 90% of people are getting this epidural, which what is going into your body is a cocktail of medications and you don't know how your body is going to respond to that. So, um, you know, fentanyl is in the news a lot right now because it because of heroin being laced with it and people getting it on the streets and um, dying um, with this, you know, opiate crisis that we have. And that is fentanyl in my area is the most commonly used medication in labor. And so you're using this very strong, 50 times stronger than heroin medication, and you might not respond well to it, and then your baby might not respond well to it. Again, I'm not saying don't use these medications, but you need to go in knowing what's going to potentially be happening to you because those surprises can create trauma, right? So if we have a baby having a hard time because of the medication going into your body, at least you're not going to come away with the idea that your body failed, right? That there's something wrong with your body and just know it was an adverse reaction to the medication. And unfortunately, because of the medical care system that we have in the United States, it's very streamlined. It's very assembly line, right? They don't come in and really thoroughly explain the pros and cons, the risks, et cetera. They, they just want to do the same thing for everybody because it's easier. It's helpful for staffing. So if they explain to you, well, we gave you this medication and we didn't explain the pros and cons to you um, and this caused your baby to crash and then we had to do a cesarean and now you have this outcome that you have to heal from and now you had this um, you know, traumatic experience with your baby and this happened because of a medication we gave you that's kind of writing the, the lawsuit for, for you, right? So oftentimes they say, well, birth is unpredictable. These things happen, right? And they make it about your body and your baby and not the system and the medication. And how, so, and how it affects, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm also kind of framing themselves, sorry if I'm echoing there, framing it's themselves okay. as the, the lifesavers, like, oh, you nearly died, you needed us. Yes. Maybe that's true. I mean, I certainly needed intervention on my second birth. I hemorrhaged. I needed doctors there to help right there. Yeah. But, um, you, you know, it's that, that, that kind of framing of, like, you weren't able to do this on your own. You needed us there to save you and, you know, so that you never, yeah, what you were talking yeah. about before. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I, I was, this was a, an experiment for me because I came from the background of, of teaching specifically natural childbirth curriculums, right? So I wanted to, when I, when I began teaching, um, you know, not that it's about a natural birth or a vaginal birth, I was a little bit wondering how people would feel when they got an epidural, would they still feel really positively about their birth experience? Because what I was experiencing before was that when I taught a, a natural childbirth class, that the people who did not have a natural birth, that there was a little bit of, ugh, I didn't do what I wanted to do. And so what I'm finding is that my clients, when we come at it with, this is a tool in these scenarios, it, it can be very, very important. And in some other scenarios, it's really about your preference. That there, we're, we're taking out the element of trauma oftentimes. Now, are there still traumatic things that happen? Yes. But if the parent knows all these things are going to happen when I choose pain medication, um, then there's not these big surprises, right? Um, they know like, oh, this happened because of this choice and, and that's okay. I made an informed decision about my care. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
there's just so much to know, isn't it? I mean, obviously epidurals and that there are there, you know, when you talk about it in those terms, like the, the fetal monitoring and everything, it's, it's become, it's a medical intervention at that point. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's a preference, but it's a medical in intervention. It comes with serious consequences potentially, you know, and, and childbirth is hard, you know, childbirth is hard. It's hard work, you know, in all sorts of ways, emotionally, physically, and it's an intense experience. And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a blessing if you just get through it and, and you can go through it and you can heal. Um, and if you do have to have interventions like, um, you know, C-section or, or other things, you know, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge other, um, like in terms of healing, it's a whole other kind of, you know, it's like, a, it's a mountain compared to a molehill, you know, trying to be a mum and heal from a, a C-section and everything else like that. Do, you know, what is, you've taught evidence-based birth, like what is that and how do women find out about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, Evidence-Based Birth was created by Rebecca Decker. Um, it started out as a blog, I think 2012. I know that when during my pregnancies um, early on, I would check it out for different issues like big babies. As someone who's had big babies myself, my first was 10 pounds and then you know quite a few big babies after that. And um, the reason she created it was because she's a nurse and she... Um, is informed. She has her PhD in nursing, um, so she she uh, you know has has gone on to do that, and uh, she's informed. And she found that that they took her baby from her after the birth, and interventions were being brought up. And she realized that she was she wasn't getting the evidence. They would just tell her, "Oh, we we have to do this." And so she really wanted to put the evidence, what she knew as someone in nursing what she knew what was, what was in the um, journals, right? And what studies have been done, she wanted to put that in the hands of parents. So the, as soon as she announced uh, an instructor program, and I had actually contacted her, I think in 2014, and when I was looking at potentially writing a childbirth curriculum, um, I asked her, I was like, do you wanna write a childbirth curriculum? Is this something you're thinking about? And she's like, no, not right now. And then in 2015, she launched a, um, a evidence-based birth instructor program, but it was not a comprehensive childbirth curriculum. It wasn't like a six-week series. It was just these little workshops. I got in on the first cohort. The first time there was going to be a training for it, I jumped on the bit back immediately um, and started teaching these little workshops, but all along kind of hoping like do a, a full curriculum as well. And so she just launched that, I think last year, maybe... Mm -hmm maybe the end of, maybe 2017. Um, I spent most of 2017 trying to get pregnant. We had a little secondary infertility. And then 2018, or 2018 pregnant that whole year. Um, so I was a little bit out of the loop for a bit. Um, so it's really about teaching when it comes to teaching professionals. I teach doulas as an evidence-based birth instructor. I teach doulas, nurses. I can offer contact hours for midwives. I teach obstetricians um, about what the evidence is because we have something called the practice gap. Have you ever heard of that? No, but I can imagine. So the difference between what they're doing in practice because that's just what they were taught at yeah. medical school and what the, the new research and studies actually say. Absolutely. So there's about a 20-year gap between evidence and what is actually being practiced. So our job is to help close that gap, right? So, and then, so we're working with the professionals to help get them the evidence. And then we're working with parents to help them to advocate for themselves to get evidence-based care. Ultimately, we have the goal of better birth experiences for the parents, but also better outcomes because we do have really terrible outcomes in the United States. It's safer to birth in 49 other countries than it is to birth here. We spend more on um, medical care than any, any other country. I think it's any other country. We spend a lot of money on medical care. Um, so it's, it's a serious situation for sure. It's incredible, actually. I've, I've experienced that for myself. My first birth, I had an obstetrician. I'd read Susan Ross's book, Birthright. I was suddenly educated about episiotomies and I was not going to have one. Thank you very much. Yeah. 
And I, I said to him, I'm not having one. He was like, you really will need one. You really should. It'll help you heal better afterwards. And I was talking to Dr. Michael Klein. Um, it's part of this series who actually mm -hmm. did the randomized study back in 1979 um, on the outcomes of episiotomy and how it actually does not make it easier to heal quite the opposite, you know, and that's why it's no longer promoted. And so, you know, I didn't, I didn't know about his study. I couldn't tell my obstetrician back that in, you know, 2007 or so. And, and, but you know, that he didn't know that what the research actually had said, you know? Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's definitely caregivers out there who are, who are behind time. So it's thank you so much for going out there and doing that research and presenting it in a way, you know, to, to keep them up to date. Uh, yeah. Do you want to, you know, you've had to have inductions, you know, as a, as a medical necessity for you. Do you want to talk about how you did that and maybe how you did that gently in a positive way coming from your framework? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually, all five of my births have been induced in one way or another. Uh, I've never gone into spontaneous labor, even waiting it out 42 weeks and three days. And that's probably because I have a couple endocrine disorders that probably contribute to that. Um, and I, it's something I feel at peace with. So I've had the very traditional, highly medicalized induction. Um, Pitocin, water's being ruptured, all of that, um, the membrane sweeps before. And in uh, my subsequent deliveries, I've actually done different kinds of induction methods or labor encouragement methods. Um, for me, it's always been um, the reasons I have been induced is because um, I, excuse me, I've had gestational diabetes in all five of my pregnancies, as well as maternal hypertension. So I always keep a close eye on my blood sugar, as well as my blood pressure. And in many instances, my blood sugar or my blood pressure starts to go up. Um, and I have to make a decision for the, my safety and my baby's safety. Um, so with my second, I chose, I asked my midwife to sweep my membranes. And with a first time mom, it's not an evidence-based choice, really. If you want to do it, then go for it. But we do see it can lead to a, a, a rough start, um, painful, non-productive contractions, spotting, this can last a few days. Um, but I was already dilated a few centimeters. I was 37 weeks and five days, and my midwife said, so it's Wednesday or so. If by Monday you don't bring your, if your blood sugar is still high, then we're going to need to switch you to an OB instead of having a midwife. And so I said, well, just in case it helps, go ahead and strip my membranes. And I've been doing the best I can on my blood sugar. I don't want to have to switch to insulin. So I asked her to do a membrane sweep. She, asked, she said, um, I don't think it worked, but with fingers crossed, I think that's a Jedi mind trick from, you know, a midwife's <laughs> perspective. And I went into labor the next day and I gave birth to him the following morning. And it was a great experience. Um, with my third, I really wanted to go into labor on my own. So I watched 40 weeks pass by, 41 weeks pass by, and then by 41 and a half weeks, I got nervous and I started to try castor oil and herbs and walking and um, membrane sweeps, induction massages, acupressure, none of it worked. And I went to 42 weeks. I went into the hospital. I asked them to do an ultrasound, a biophysical profile just to see how baby was doing. Um, they wanted me to do an induction right there, but I didn't feel ready. So I went home AMA against medical advice. It was a hard decision. I went home and cried and wondered, am I going to kill my baby? What am I doing? Then the following day, I felt at peace. I felt like I want to go into the hospital. I want to go have an induction. It feels like the right thing to do. I'm not feeling bullied right now. Um, I selected my doctor carefully for who I would see. He actually helped pick some nurses to, for my time there who had actually worked as midwives previously. So they were on board with my goals. I needed interventions. I needed my waters to be released. I chose that. 
Um, I want, I chose to have an epidural because I had a really, really uncommon thing happen um, where I had a spasm of the lower uterine segment. Baby was stuck up at the top. Um, and then the bottom of my uterus was spasming and causing me to push at six centimeters. Oh, no. Exterior baby, nothing was wrong with the position of baby apart from maybe being really, really high. I had my midwife there, I had my doula, I had a very hands-off obstetrician with me. And I made the call. I said, you know what? I know I'm, you know, I'm a birth professional. I know my body is bearing down at a time where it's not a good time for this to happen. I asked for the epidural. They asked me, they gave me a very light epidural. Um, and it caused my uterus to relax and release. And in five centimeters, he was down. I was fully complete. I pulled myself into a squat and I was able to squat and bear down and, and help to push him. So, so with him, ultimately the induction method, because I didn't want Pitocin, was an artificial release of my membranes. I had been walking around at five centimeters for a week already. So I felt like it was safe, even though he was up high. I understand that was a little bit of a risky move. It felt right for me. Um, our fourth baby, I went the rough route of castor oil, which is not a fun way to go, but we do have this evidence now that it doesn't increase bad outcomes with baby. Um, fortunately, I didn't have a severe reaction with vomiting and yes. um, having to be in the toilet too much, but it was a fast labor, about 47 minutes um, from start to, to finish. N not, not what I recommend. It's nice to have some time to warm up to labor. Um, and then this, my fifth baby, I went with castor oil again, um, but it didn't quite work out. Um, I, we, I took it um, as per the recommendation, the amount for my midwife over a week's time and I would have contractions, I was dilating. So again, I decided to just go into the birth center and I'd already been dilated to five centimeters and I asked my midwife to just break my waters. I felt comfortable with that, the pros and cons and the, the risks there. And I went into labor and I had an amazing water birth. It was what was right for me. At so, the different decisions or different options are going to be right for different people. Someone else might say, you know, I really want Pitocin. That's what's right for me. Or I really want to do Cervidil. That's what's right for me. Um, knowing what it goes along with when what risks and what benefits there are. So there's at least 14 different induction methods. It's important that you learn. Yeah, if you actually go down and list them, um, then yeah, there's a lot of different I always, methods. I, um, I, used, I always used pink primrose oil. I'd take that. And mm -hmm. I, I, I think my, I, I looked it up. I don't know if other, other people do this, but what I did for my second one that worked was, um, was I looked up like what foods trigger progesterone in your body. And yeah. I, the, so I, and that's what evening primrose oil does. So I, 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 the second pregnancy, I took maca powder, which you can get from most supermarkets, and totally. uh, and evening primrose oil, and what those like really work a treat. But that that was just me, and every like there's just so many. That's incredible. There are so many, and some are very very low risk or no risk. So in my book, what I did was I color coded induction methods. Yeah. So what we have is things like. Um, orgasm, acupressure, yeah. <laughs> massage, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. See, I put semen down in there. I put that as green. As long as you're not on pelvic rest, go for it. Knock yourself out. Get lot. Get go get massages. Use acupressure. Um, have sex. There's yeah. prostaglandins in semen. Yeah. Orgasm uh, yeah. is stimulates oxytocin. Yeah. And then I did an orange zone. So orange zone is mostly things you can do at home, but there might be some level of risk or there might be, it might be contraindicated for you. Yeah. So for yeah. example, herbs, herbs are not appropriate for everybody, but for some people it's a really great option. Castor oil. Um, let's see, what else do I have in the, in the orange zone? Um, nipple stimulation. Yeah. People think of that as something, but that can, can stimulate stronger contractions. Um, so that's orange zone. There might be reasons why we might not want to do it. Um, and then I did a red zone where it's the things that you really have to do in the hospital, right? So cytotech or mesoprostol 
or cervidil or, um, or Pitocin or artificial rupture of membranes. Not saying don't do those things, but those carry higher risks associated with them, mm -hmm. right? So a common question when someone's looking at an induction, I did write an induction survival guide. So you could Google induction survival guide, birth chemistry, it should pop up for you. Mm -hmm. But something I'll oftentimes ask people if they're going in for an induction is, what are some things that would make you feel more out of control and what would they make you feel more in control? So something that someone might choose is, you know, I really don't want to be tied down into an IV. That's really important to me. So we're going to look which methods do not necessitate an IV. Or someone might say, I really don't want to do anything that can't be undone. Mm. Right? So I don't want to take a pill that I can't get out of my body. So that might be, you know what? If you're okay with an IV, Pitocin might be the best choice for you because we can turn that Pitocin off if it's not going well for you, right? And I've even had clients have the Pitocin turned off, IV out of their arm and go home for half the day, take a nap, take a shower, eat a meal, and then come back the, the following evening and give it another go, right? So there's different values that different families have or different birthing people are gonna have that's going to lead them into a specific induction direction. That's incredible information. Do you have your book there? Do you want to show us what your book looks like? Yeah, for sure. So here's my book, Birth Chemistry. And um, it's fully color. So we have beautiful oh. photography with um, from Paige Driscoll at Santa Cruz Birth Photography. She graciously let me, um, gave me a bunch of beautiful images to to use throughout the, the book. Mm -hmm. So it's all the photos are from real births. Mm -hmm. So instead of having a um, birthing person posing in different laboring positions, we see people actually laboring. Um, I'll show you some examples. And you see the effort on their face. And so you can see there, Oh, yeah. That these couples are working really hard, right? So you see naked bodies, right? You see potential medical interventions. You see sweat and you see some blood and some effort. And, and um, it's important for people to see what normal birth looks like and how different normal birth can look, right? So different positions and that it is really very different than seeing someone who is just posed, fully clothed, smiling, leaning over a ball, right? Like most of us don't look like that in labor. <laughs> we don't. Do you, do you no. have, if someone, if someone is planning, like wants a cesarean, wants to do it gently, do you have any recommendations for them that comes from your framework? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is find a care provider who has experience in gentle cesareans. Ask them what do they think a gentle cesarean is, right? Instead of just giving them the answers right off the bat or saying, I want this thing and this thing, if you can give them a great list. And what my experience has been in our area is that if you tell a provider, I want this, this, and this, they'll usually just say, cool, great, we'll do that. But then day of the birth, they're usually gonna do what they're used to doing. Right, um, a big part of being a med student early on is learning how to make decisions, sleep deprived and hungry, um, and, and just make it a more of a reflex, right? So it's really possible that the doctor is just very used to, instead of handing that baby over the curtain or straight to the birthing person's chest, to hand it off to the nurse and the nurse is just used to doing it their way. So find out, have they done a birth, a, a cesarean birth the way that you want that your cesarean birth done? In our community, we have those providers. In your community, if you don't have those providers yet, then you might need to kind of walk them through the process. I hope you have those providers in your, in your area, but we definitely, we just recently in our county had the first intact placenta birth for a cesarean that that we know of we asked around 
and this family wanted to have as they knew they were going to have a cesarean but wanted to have as holistic process as possible they wanted the baby and the placenta to remain intact together um, mm -hmm. because they wanted to make sure the baby did get their full blood volume mm -hmm. and they didn't want to hurry that process so we had baby go straight to the birthing person's chest breastfeeding there the placenta was in a bowl close by um, if you go, the, this there's actually pictures of this birth. If you go to Santa Cruz birth photography um, page, you will go to her Instagram and scroll down a bit. This birth was in June, I think. Um, so find out, do they have any experience? Get a doula who is experienced in gentle cesareans, if you can. If you don't, if there aren't any in your area, find someone who's willing to advocate vocally right? Not all doulas feel comfortable speaking up in the birth space. And I get why. It is hard when I have to speak up and maybe it's a tense situation um, and my heart's pounding, but I rely on my training to be able to keep the, the communication positive. So someone who could, can be vocal and find out what elements of the birth are the most important to you. Right. So oftentimes that's going to be skin to skin immediately after the birth. Right. Breastfeeding there um, in the birth room, having your partner and maybe your doula close by. Um, there's all kinds. If, if you look up YouTube, if you look up natural cesarean, there's some great videos that come up. I use the term gentle cesarean. That's what feels good for me. But also people call them family centered cesareans. Um, mother friendly cesareans, et cetera, et cetera. So it's something that we have quite a bit of access to now, but I remember when the first one happened, it's only been in the last five or six years that it's, it's even happening at all in our yeah. community. Absolutely. I think it's, it's really great. It's being done. There's been so many brave pioneers out there um, asking for it and, and advocating for it for themselves. And, you know, the, and so it's just fantastic. Um, so how do people follow you? How do they come and learn with you? And, you know, how do they connect? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on Facebook, look up birth chemistry, um, find that there. You're welcome to set, um, friend me on my personal account, Corey Vavoda Gentry. Um, and then on Instagram, I actually, I really have resisted making a business account on Instagram because there's just I try to reduce the amount of time I'm looking at my phone um, because it's not a great example to my children. <laughs> However, I get it. Instagram is where it's at. Um, so I just made a birth chemistry Instagram account. So you can jump on there. Um, you're welcome to hop over to my personal account. Um, so at birth chemistry is my business account at pink ink or in pink ink is my personal account and there's lots of birth stuff over there um but you'll also find my babies and my doggies and and everything else that's amazing well, thank you for your time so much corey it's been great thank speaking you. Thank you. look i'm gonna just ask one more question and i mean that is um how do we when we go into hospital like how do we improve our the like, general birthing experiences there What's absolutely the key, the real key the real juice yeah, for uh, in our personal births or birth for everybody? Up to you how you want to answer it, but you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So communication is going to be really important. Um, try to, uh, actually, I'm going to plug someone else's book, which is so good. Um, Mastering Respectful Confrontation. Um, such a good book just for life, for parenting, for dealing with your own children, as well as your own parents and everyone. So learning how to see people as not your adversary, find a common ground, because if you are fighting, no one's going to win there, right? Even if you fight for what you want in your birth um, and you get what you want, not the victory that I hope for my clients. I want there to not be a fighting. Um, I want you to get what you want by communicating clearly. So that's what I would recommend is, is communication, get those resources. 
Beautiful. I love it. We all need that in our lives, I think. <laughs> how to how for to have sure. respectful confrontations. You know, we need to have, you know, one, knowing where our boundaries are, knowing that we have to advocate for those boundaries, and then knowing, you know, that we have the tools to advocate for those boundaries. You know, that's really important yeah. stuff we all need to have. Thank you for your time so much, Corey. Thank um, you for doing this. Oh my God. <laughs> Everyone, thank you for listening to the Learning to Birth webinar series. You can go and listen to some more. And of course, come and follow us at Learn to Birth on Facebook and Instagram. And we'll see Corey there down on, on Facebook and Instagram too. Hey. Great. Bye yeah. everyone.